first thing I want to do is I want to thank everybody for such a beautiful Good Friday service. And I'm going to tell you, the highlight of the night, at least for me, was hearing each one of you share God's Word. And I want to tell you, from Samuel's prophesy to Bill's Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. I want to tell you, some of you um, are really good orators. I mean, like, like it was really a treat to, to just listen to the emotion up here. Um, I pray that that story of our redemption never grows old, ever. Um, and the way it doesn't grow old is by keeping our eyes fixed afresh on the mercies of God shown to us in Jesus Christ. All we need to do is reflect over our past week and see our need for, for Him never fades. It never fades. In Christ, even in our sanctification, we even talked about it this morning during class, even in our sanctification, we need Jesus just as much today. We need His crucifixion and the promise of His resurrection just as much today as when we first began this journey. That's right. I compared the story of, of Christ's um, love for us on the cross I compared the other night to the running into a house fire. Well, if I simply ran into a house fire with no other purpose than that, just for the sake of saying I love you, and actually accomplished nothing, then what's the point? But Christ died for us only means something if the for us if the forest part of the equation means that we get some kind of benefit out of that. And so this morning, while we've looked at the cross in depth on Friday and what that means, that's only the first half of the climax of redemption. The other half is the resurrection itself. Since we began with the triumphal entry in Luke, and then we cover Jesus' passion from Luke. I think it's only fitting that we cover this Resurrection Sunday, the story of the empty tomb from the Gospel of Luke 2. So if you go ahead and start turning your way there, we'll be in Luke 24, and we'll be reading the first 12 verses. Just as a reminder, where we left off Friday night with Jesus being placed in another man's tomb... I'm not sure how you spent your day yesterday. But for the disciples, not just the 11, but the women and all the disciples, that first Saturday had to have seemed like the bleakest day in all of history. Bleaker than any day you and I have ever experienced. You see... Our hope is not in the cross itself. Although, apart from the cross, you and I are still in our sins. Our hope is in the resurrection. The resurrection is our central hope. It's the central hope of the believer. That first Saturday, all hope seemed utterly lost but then came Sunday morning. Yes. So if you would follow along with me, um, I'm not going to ask you to stand because it is a longer passage. Um, if you'd like to, you may. Um, but I'm going to start reading at the beginning of chapter 24, beginning at verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter, oh, I love Peter. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that this morning you would show us the glory and the beauty of the resurrection, just what the resurrection of your Son has accomplished for us. Make your word a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I've titled this message, The Rolling Away of All Reproach. Now, there's a bit of a problem with this title because if you look at the passage we just read, the word reproach is not in there. But I assure you, the idea is certainly there. All we need to do is recall the shame and the insults that Jesus endured on Friday and the shame that the apostles themselves endured on Friday and Saturday as well. In fact, the major th reproach is a major theme throughout the entire narrative of redemption history. It's a broad word that entails Every kind of shame or embarrassment, mocking, insult, any kind of displeasure in another person. It also includes um, things that are not even due to our own um, Actions, our own sinful behavior. It includes things like our defilement, disease, our disabilities. But of course, yes, the greatest of all of our reproaches is our sin, our very sin, nature. But it is important for us to recognize that not every form of reproach is the same. You see, the shame each of us bears might, is not necessarily and not often a one-for-one -one ratio with our sin. You see, a woman who is raped has no responsibility for that sin against her, but yet she bears the reproach from her perpetrator. And sadly, that act of injustice against her, the world and our best systems of injustice are unable to remove or resolve that reproach or shame. But the resurrection... A man born with a deformity bears the reproach due to no fault of his own. We are right to see such tragedies as evil, even as injustices, because that is exactly what they are. But without sin in the world, none of these atrocities would even exist. Oh, how you and I need the resurrection. Early in Luke's Gospel, he records the account of Elizabeth and Zechariah. And Elizabeth was barren. She was unable to bear children. She was advanced in years. She had borne the shame of not 
being able to um, pass her, her, um, her livelihood, her life, her, her, her heredity. I'm struggling here. <laughs> she was not able to pass her, her being on through future generations. And so she bore the reproach of that. But when she conceives, Gabriel comes and shares the good news and says that she will indeed bear a son. And when she does conceive, this is what she says. The Lord has taken away my reproach among people. She was barren and thus as good as dead. No one to carry her memory after her. She was a living tomb, so to speak. But the Lord gave new resurrection life to that which was dead. So just what has the resurrection accomplished? The first thing I want us to look at is the reproach of the law itself. I'm going to back up a couple verses, um, starting at verse, uh, chapter 23, verse 54. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. You see, they were required by the law to keep the Sabbath. Once the sun went down on Friday night, they were to do no work on Saturday. Now, this law that was holy and righteous and good had kept the women from ministering to their Lord's dead body. They were not even able to give him the dignity of a proper burial. But never again will that law separate them from their Lord. You see, Christ had fulfilled the law. He had satisfied the law perfectly. Now, though they did not yet know it, the women would be forever free from the law that kept them from their Lord. Notice the urgency in verse 1. As soon as the rest of the commandment required has been satisfied, as soon as dawn breaks, the Sabbath is put on hold for six days. And they're off to the tomb early in the morning with their spices, their aromatics, and they that they had prepared on Friday evening. It was but just one day, one extra day that they had to wait. But how long that day must have seemed to them. How shameful, how reproachful the law must have seemed in those hours. But the resurrection rolls away even the reproach of the law. Yes. Now, what is the emphasis of this first day? On the first day of the week. I would argue that the thrust of the narrative, not just Luke's, but the entire Bible storyline is that this first day is the commencing of a new creation. If we back up, it is on the sixth day, on Friday, the sixth day, Christ is on the cross, and what does he call out? It is finished. On the sixth day, God finished his work. And then on the seventh day, he rested. What did Jesus do on the seventh day? He rested. And then begins the first day of the week. A new creation is at hand. The old has been removed. The new has come. That's actually part of the point of circumcision itself. You see, when was circumcision supposed to take place? Anybody know? Any takers? Eighth day. Eighth day, which is actually the first, day. the first day of the week. Why? Because it's the putting off of the old self and put, you know, removing the old self. 
That's what circumcision is pointing to. But the problem is that physical circumcision wasn't sufficient. It didn't actually do anything. Yes, it's the covenant sign, but it represented more than that. You and I, we need a better circumcision than the one the nation of Israel experienced. We need the putting off of our entire sinful flesh. Then look at verses 2 and 3. And they found the stone having been rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Absolutely. I want to spend just a bit unpacking this. The first is the significance of this word tomb. The word is actually means a memorial. Um, it's a place of remembrance. In fact, it comes from the same word. It's very close to the Greek word for remembrance. Even in our narrative, we have the word remember. They're so close to the same word. Now, why does that matter? Well, it takes us to the second reproach that must be dealt with, and that is the reproach of death. Because death is a constant reminder of the reproach due to sin. When you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. And since the fall, death has reigned. We have borne the reproach of death ever since mankind was booted from the garden. And God placed cherubim with a flaming sword to guard us from coming back in and making our way to the tree of life. If you, you, if you recall, when Sarah died, Abraham bought a cave in which to bury his dead out of his sight. But the cavern tomb served as a regular reminder of the reproach of death. Mankind has sought every way possible to try to hide death and the atrocity that it is. We try to mask its disgrace and its shame. The women are even bringing their aromatic spices to try to cover up, to mask the odor of Christ's dead body. As if our best attempts to mask death truly accomplish anything at all. But oh, the aroma of an empty tomb. What compares to the scent of resurrection, the scent of life itself? Listen to this from Job. For there is hope for a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease. Though its root grow old in the earth, and its stump die in the soil, yet at the scent of water, it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. You see, for a tree, the scent of living water brings about new growth even for that which was dead. For us, it's the scent of the aroma of Christ, who is our living water, that gives new life to us. Job continues, But a man, when he dies, he is laid low. He breathes his last, and where is he? A man lies down, and he rises not again. Oh, that you, Lord, would hide me in Sheol, Job says. Remember, Job is going through immense suffering as if God had turned his face away from him, his favor away, and all that's left is wrath and fury, the reproach of the Lord's displeasure. The most righteous man on the planet enduring the greatest suffering ever, at least until Jesus. Continuing on, oh, that you would conceal me, Job says, until your wrath be passed, that you would appoint me a time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? 
O oh Job, and O oh for us Jobs, you Jobs out there, I have news for you. The resurrection says yes. Amen. He will live again. The resurrection rolls away the very reproach of death. The second key, I think, that helps us unpack this idea of rolling away reproach is found in Joshua 5, verse 9, which I, I read earlier. After Israel crosses the Jordan River, you may, you may just want to turn there just so you can see it yourself. Joshua 5, 9. I, I just think that it will be helpful for you. After Israel crosses the Jordan River and they're about to take the promised land, God has promised them they need to be circumcised. Why? Well, because the first generation that God brought out of Egypt, they were ungrateful and they refused to enter the land God had given them. So they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until that entire generation died. During those 40 years, the new generation hadn't been circumcised. They still bore the reproach of their fathers. Now, starting at verse 8, Joshua 5, 9, verse, or 5, Joshua 5, verse 8, when the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. There's so much I would love to share with you regarding this passage. But I cut out over a whole page because I don't want to overwhelm you. One day we can talk about that. Um, but it is fascinating. I'm just going to point, the, point out these couple things. In the New Testament, we come across the Aramaic form of the word Gilgal. Some of you are better already guessing what it is. Golgotha. We pronounce it in our translations, Golgotha, which is the very place, the very name of the mount Jesus was crucified and bore our reproach, our disgrace. If we keep reading through Joshua 5, it is only through Israel's reproach being rolled away at Gilgal that they began to enjoy the fruit of the promised land, which Joshua was leading them into. Well, Joshua is simply the Hebrew word for Jesus. There's no variation in spelling whatsoever in the Greek. It is only through Golgotha, Jesus, the true and better Joshua, has taken our reproach upon himself, that he leads us, he has conquered death in the resurrection, and he now leads us into the promised land. But as we mentioned, the cross by itself is not sufficient. We need that resurrection. And hence, the stone is rolled away from the tomb. The resurrection rolls away the reproach of Jesus, the reproach Jesus bore in our place. Back to our passage in Luke. On the first day of the week, the day of new creation, the new exodus is about to commence. The women found the stone having been rolled away but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Verse 4, two men in dazzling apparel, or rather, flashing garments, stood by. This should take us back to the, the cherubim that guarded the entrance of the tomb with the flaming sword. But they're not guarding anymore, keeping people out. The way has been opened. The curtain has been torn in two. They say to the women, why do you seek the living among the dead? Don't you know that it's dead people you find inside tombs? He's not here, but he's risen. Now we've heard this so many times that we take it for granted. The shock and the, that that must have been for the women that first day. Truly astonishing. 
The men continue, remember, there's a word from tomb. Remember how he told you while he was yet in Galilee. Jesus knew how these events would play out. And he departed for Jerusalem anyway. Why? Text goes on. Because it was necessary that the Son of Man be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. It was necessary that this Jesus be delivered. The psalm that Steve opened our service with, Psalm 89, again, you can turn there if you'd like. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. Well, that psalm takes an unexpected turn about four-fifths of the way through it. After 37 verses of the psalmist praising God for His steadfast love and His confirming His word to the coming son of David, who He will never turn His good grace from. The psalm changes to a minor key. This is starting at verse 38. But now you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed. All who pass by plunder him. You can picture the soldiers casting lots for Jesus' very garments, plundering him while he is helpless on the cross. He has become the scorn of his neighbors. Verse 44, if you're following along. You have made his splendor to cease and cast his throne in the ground, cutting the days of his youth short and covering his face with shame. Verse 48, what man can live forever and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, the faithful love, the faithfulness you swore to David? Remember, O Lord, the reproach of your servant and how I bear in my heart the reproach of all peoples. The Lord's fulfilling of his steadfast love is shown through the seeming defeat of the Son of Man, this Son of David, His anointed, the Messiah. And there are numerous passages in Scripture where it's recorded that the reproach God's people deserved fell on a single man, a single servant of the Lord. Jesus bore our reproach. The strong man obligating himself to bear with the failings of the weak Paul would say. But as Paul reminds us in Romans, Christ did not live to please himself, but the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me, he says. The cross and the resurrection are necessary, not just to roll away our reproach, but God's reproach. Psalm 69, from which Paul quotes, reads, for it is for your sake Speaking of God, speaking of Elohim, it is for your sake I have borne reproach that dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. Jesus did not just endure the rejection of Israel. His own family, his own brothers did not believe in him. For zeal for your house has consumed me. The house called by God's name had become a house of disgrace. And here it is. And the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Jesus, more than anything else, rolls away the reproach of none other than God. But this rolling away of the reproach of God is only fully satisfied with the resurrection. Without the resurrection, it's incomplete. Well, going back 
to our passage, remember how Jesus said, it was necessary. And the women remembered his words. This might not seem all that important of a verse for us to dwell on. But part of the rolling away of Jesus' reproach is that he didn't walk into this blindly. Sinful men did not get the better of Jesus as if they had outwitted him or trapped him. Be careful of ever thinking, poor Jesus. He became poor, deliberately so, for you and me. And oh, how thankful we should be. He gave himself into their plans purposefully. Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. He says, the ruler of this age is coming. He has no authority over me. But I do. He's talking about going to the cross. I do as the Father has commanded so that the world will know that I love the Father. Or, as Bill read Friday night, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Jesus needs none of our pity. But we certainly need His. Yes, what others did was absolutely wicked. But Jesus never for a moment was out of control or at their mercy. As the women reflect back, they remember that Jesus said all of this would take place, and it did so exactly as planned. And we praise God that it did. Verse 9. And so the women returned and told the eleven and all the rest. And then in verse 10, we're given their names. Why? Well, part of that is because these are the witnesses, right? But perhaps even more so, it's because these witnesses aren't believed. You see, it's not generic individuals who bear the reproach of their peers not believing them. These are real people like you and I. Their words in verse 11 seem like foolishness, like an idle tale. So they weren't believed, or at least not by most. You and I, we carry the most astounding news in all the world. News that sounds too good to be true. Don't be surprised when others don't believe you. Or even worse, when they mock and cast insults at you. The resurrection has rolled away that reproach. Though it may not be fully manifested just yet, those who trust in Jesus shall not ultimately be put to shame. Jesus will indeed reveal himself and prove our words to be right, faithful, and true. Even if for many, that isn't until the culmination of history. But our prayer, yours and my prayer, however, is that Jesus would indeed reveal himself to those whom we have witnessed, that he would indeed reveal himself some now. And if we continue on in Luke's narrative, that is exactly what he did. Two people are walking on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus shows up on the road, and he reveals himself to them. Oh, how they doubt it. But Jesus came near and opened their eyes and their hearts to believe. And at one point, that was you and me. We needed our eyes and hearts opened. All that reproach the women had bore from just those two men, just take this example, that they bore from just those two men had been rolled away at the revealing of Jesus. Keep sharing that good news. Whatever reproach you may bear now, for some, they're going to come along. Jesus is going to be revealed to them now. And that reproach will be very short-lived. Others, they'll be at the end of history. But that reproach will still be rolled away. But verse 12, not all of them 
doubted. There was one, Peter, who when they initially shared the news, he rose and ran to the tomb. Of all the disciples who followed Jesus, those last several hours couldn't have been harder for anyone than they were for Peter, who knew he had let down his Lord in his one hour of need, sleeping when he should have been praying. He even embarrassed his Lord by drawing the sword and cutting off the ear of the high priest's servant. To further show Peter's shame in this event, Jesus not only has to rebuke Peter and tell him to put his sword away, Jesus has to pick up the ear and put it back on the man and heal him. Sir, I'm sorry about that. I'm working with him. Peter's still in training. He's got a little bit more to learn here. Isn't that, the, isn't that us? Yeah. That's us. We're just like that. We often don't think of how this set with Peter. One failure after another. One failure after another. Maybe you feel like that's your life. One failure after another. One failure after another. And then the biggest failure of all. Denying that he even knew his Lord. Not once, but three times. And that in the span of an hour where Peter had plenty of time to contemplate what was going on in his actions. And on that third and final time, in the middle of his last denial, he locks eyes with his Lord. And the rooster crows. Can you imagine that shame? Now what was Peter to do? Was he to rescue Jesus? No, I don't think that would at all be a fair expectation. Or even a faithful thing for Peter to have done. No, Peter. Just be a man of your word. You said you were ready to go to prison with me. That you were ready even to die with me. Instead, you sought to save your own skin. Faithfulness in Peter's case would have simply been to remain by his Lord's side and pray. So not only does Peter bear the reproach of believing in a false Messiah who ultimately couldn't even save himself, much less a nation. Peter let down his friend in the worst possible way. Not merely deserting his friend like the rest did, but passionately crying out, I do not even know the man. Have you been there? I think if you're honest, if we're honest, most of us have found ourselves embarrassed and in shame, ashamed, and even fearful of associating ourselves with the Lord Jesus and the God of the Bible. Oh, sure, when we are surrounded by faithful believers, or if we at least have one faithful brother or sister by our side, which is part of the reason why they're sent out two by two, we can stand bold. But you put us in a circle like the one Peter was in, all that changes. Surely, your Jesus can't be the only way to heaven. You know, we all really believe basically the same thing. We're all just doing our best. Surely God honors that. You don't really believe you Christians have all the answers, do you? I hear your God is a homophobe. What about those faithfully living out their own religion who have never even heard of Jesus, never even had the opportunity? Would you really have me believe your God doesn't regard their faithfulness? That he would actually consign one to hell for simply not knowing and worshiping his son? 
There's a lot for us to say in any of these situations. That these words that seek to distort the truth of what we believe. My point is, do we address these things in a way that brings honor to our Lord? Or shame? By denying the truth. But with the resurrection, Peter's hope is suddenly alive. And this living hope led him to jump to his feet and run to the tomb and marvel. Could it be? Could it be? The empty tomb was the only thing that rolled away the women's reproach. The resurrection was the only thing that could roll away Peter's reproach. And the resurrection is the only thing that can roll away ours. Amen. But without the resurrection, not only are you and I still in our sins, Jesus would be a fraud. Perhaps someone acknowledges, Pilate and Herod did, and even one of the thieves, that Jesus was innocent of any wrongdoing, at least anything deserving of death. But then we fail to realize that the greatest offense would have been Jesus' setting himself up as equal with God. Not only in the breaking of the first commandment, you shall have another gods beside me, it was also the very sin that caused the fall all the way back in Eden, where by eating the fruit, Adam and Eve were convinced they believed, they were persuaded that they too could be like God. But if Jesus is God, if he spoke with the authority of God, the people would say, we never heard anyone like this. He's a man who speaks with authority. Or if he does the works of God, possessing authority over creation itself, even the winds and the waves obey, even diseases obey him, the demons obey him, even death itself obeys him. And if he had authority to forgive sin, not simply the wrong done to fellow image bearers, but to forgive sin against God himself. See, I can't forgive Chase's sin against Krista. I can only forgive the sins done to me, done towards me. Jesus can only forgive sin against God if he indeed is very God himself. The stone rolled in front of the tomb said in the loudest possible way that history has sealed its verdict on this man. That he was nothing more than a fraud. As C.S. Lewis would say, leaving him to be either a lunatic or a liar. As a side note, one of the reasons why we read dead people is that the witness of their life has been sealed. Think of the countless church leaders who have apostatized and how many who followed them have turned and fallen away. Why? Because they placed their hope in a mortal man and by such they had added to their own reproach of disgrace and shame. You see, death seals the verdict of one's life with one exception. The resurrection. The testimony of Jesus' life, that he was either a lunatic or liar, was sealed by a great stone. But all of a sudden, that testimony was rolled back Proving Jesus to be everything he claimed to be. Lord of all creation. 
the cross and resurrection. They go hand in hand. Otherwise, both are absolutely powerless. Without Jesus bearing our sin and shame, our very reproach, then justice is not satisfied. But without the resurrection, justice is still incomplete because Jesus was fully innocent. While on the cross, Jesus bore our reproach. But only in the resurrection is the reproach finally rolled away once and for all. Jesus' resurrection is the guarantee that ours is certain. But a final word of warning. The rolling away of reproach is only for those who have trusted Jesus as payment for their sin. Jesus is bearing your reproach in your place. Have you trusted Jesus in that way. Scripture says, whoever trusts in him will not be put to shame. One day, all, every single person who's ever walked this planet will stand before God's throne and give an account. And the greatest trial ever. You've heard the phrase, trial of the century. We've seen nothing yet. Each will stand before God's throne with all of creation looking on to give an account of our every deed. Oh, and not our supposedly good deeds that we think we've done. No, only those which fell below God's image-bearing standard. Imagine your every simple thought, word, and action being replayed before all to see and hear. You and I have no idea what true shame, disgrace, embarrassment, and yes, reproach is. And let me further warn, there will be no glamorizing of sin and hell, only torment for it. But for those who have trusted Jesus to bear their reproach, the one who sits at the right hand of the Father will say, we have no need to review this one. I paid for that. For those who have trusted in Jesus, that tomb, that grave of remembrance of all their shame and sin will be forever disposed of. The resurrection rolls away our every reproach. Now, before God himself, and on the last day, before all of creation. Let's pray. Oh Jesus, how we need you. Every hour we need you. Oh, how thankful we are that you bore our reproach and our shame on the cross, that you bore our very sin. But that was not enough. Thank you all the more that you rose from the grave and that you live right now interceding on our behalf. And so we have confidence, we have hope that every, every shame that we may bear in this age, every reproach will be one day rolled away for good because we know that you are good for it. We love you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.